Hi, I'm going to try and explain to you some basic principles of chemistry that are developed over time. It's quite a complicated mix and it may be quite difficult to explain, so I'm going to try and simplify it as much as possible. We're going to start with the Greeks who thought that the world is made up of earth, air, fire and water which seemed fairly logical and lasted for a long, long time because that's what people could see and they couldn't see anything else. So that's where chemistry started. There was an idea that there was things made up of particles, but that kind of died by Demetrius, but that kind of got left behind because no one could actually prove it or see it. So that went on for quite a long time. Uh, this guy called Beecher, they started playing around with different things. Uh, the alchemists, they were trying to live forever, trying to make gold. So that's where they started playing around with different elements, uh, different materials. They didn't know what they were. They were burning things. They left something behind. They called this phlogiston. And this idea uh, just kind of kept them in the dark for a long, long time. Now, the real breakthrough came with this guy called Priestley where he managed to play around with different airs and basically realized that, well, if the Earth really was made up of air, and how come we can have different types of air? So that kind of was the start. It wasn't, it wasn't until Lavoisier here uh, really put a, put a nail in the coffin of that, but he really started the idea. Uh, I'll just play this video here. I'll have to kill the volume on that, where he got this uh, magne this uh, mercury oxide here that's an orange color, burnt it, and it was reduced down to mercury there, and the bubbles came off, and that was then tested and had various properties. Uh, this splint, I'll just give you the sound if they're going to do it. The combustion accelerates in the oxygen. And the oh, sorry, it's not the pop. All right, it's a relighting of the splint. All right, so that was different to air, so it had its own properties. All right, uh, he also discovered uh, carbon dioxide put flames out. All right, and this is the collection of another type of gas where you put... Uh, magnesium in, you can collect that gas, that's hydrogen. Various tests were done on these things. I'll just go to a general video on, on testing for gases. Uh, you've got several gases here. This one here is the pop test. Quickly get the volume. Just heard. The gas is probably hydrogen. All right. Uh, then we can have uh, Carbon dioxide, which he also discovered, mix it with lime water and makes the water go milky. So here you can see carbon dioxide, hydrogen, oxygen. Air is made up of different fractions, different types of airs. So air is now broken up. It's not, everything in the world is not just earth, air, fire, and water. Air has different uh, components to it. All right, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and uh and uh, hydrogen were some of the airs that were being discovered. All right, this guy, Lavoisier, is considered the father of chemistry because he really made the biggest breakthroughs. Uh, what I find interesting is he had the best laboratory in the whole world. He had like 10,000 pieces of glassware. Uh, he was also an aristocrat that got killed in some, one of the French sort of uh, revolutions. I forget which one it was, but he got killed by the French people, which is quite interesting. Uh, so some of these chemists suffered terrible fates. Uh, he was very key because he measured substances. So he could measure the weight before and after. He measured that things, mass before is equal mass after. Uh, he st gave the name, the nomenclature, he gave the naming system so we could all start making some progress by naming chemicals and moving forward. Uh, and he defined elements and tried to discover elements so he made a lot of progress, took credit for Priestley's uh, oxygen, and uh, really made a huge jumps forward, developing that there are the worlds made up of elements. I think at the time he was up to about 33, so that actually definitely killed the idea of earth, air, fire, and water as being the only four elements in this world. Uh, now there's 33. 
from here on in we'll stop talking about elements because they just continually discover more and more. All right. Uh, the next guy is uh, Dalton who uh, just rethought up the idea of atoms uh, and he went across and measured uh, the weights of different things because they knew they were in different ratios. Hydrogen was the lightest known one. So he put that as one and he tried to work out what the weights were based on ratios and measuring of weight, working off the boss here and came up. Uh, with these things as elements and their weights. All right, so some things were still beaten and discovered. All right, potash, soda, uh, these things were still compounds, but they thought they were elements. So more and more experiments were discovering different, different ways to break things down, including electrolysis, which we're kind of skipping here. All right, so now we're coming up with the idea that things are made of, uh, that the elements are uh, single, indivisible pieces. Now, Mendeleev uh, was also just trying to make sense of it. Uh, he basically was dividing stuff up by, based on the, uh, their chemical properties. If I show this video here, uh, this here, if I just break this up, this is the group one metals that are here. And why are they all here? Because they're all shiny, soft, they can get cut, uh, they oxidize quite quickly. As soon as you cut this, it ox the shininess disappears. There's the shininess, and now it's gone. Instantly disappears. Put them in water. Uh, if you put universal indicator in there, it'll make it basic, and they burn, react very quickly. So he put all of those ones here, one, two, three, four, five, six, in order, and there you go. All right, similarly, these things all have specific chemical properties. For instance, these non-metals here, uh, if you burn them in oxygen, uh, they will produce an acid when mixed with water, and that will become red. That's the case for uh, these all of these nonmetals here when they react with oxygen. So he was lining them up all based on their chemical properties, and he found out that there were these repeating patterns. All right, so that helped us a lot. Now with Thompson. Uh, he was the one who discovered that the atoms themselves actually had an, a negative particle inside. All right, and uh, I'll stop right there because I'll just skip to a video. It was here in Cambridge that the first clear evidence for smaller objects inside the atom was found. Many of the great scientists of history have walked these streets, and one of the greatest was J.J. Thompson who became the director of this, the old Cavendish Laboratory. In 1896, Thompson had just got his hands on this new piece of kit. Now, it's essentially a particle accelerator. When this plate's heated, particles are emitted. They're accelerated by these electrodes. They pass through these two plates, across which you can apply a voltage, and they hit the end of the bulb here on a screen which glows, so you can see the beam. Now this is a modern version of Thomson's apparatus. Again, we've got the particle accelerator, and there's a screen in there so you can see the beam glow. What Thomson did was he varied the voltage across the plates, and he measured the amount of bending as the voltage changed. That allows you to deduce the mass of the particles in the beams. Now, the lightest known particle in Thomson's day was the hydrogen atom. But Thomson found from these measurements that the particles in this beam are almost 2,000 times lighter than hydrogen atoms. Thomson had discovered the first subatomic particle, the electron. The uh, electron owes its practical utility. utility to its smallness. It might apparently Shakespeare say my use is great because I am so small. The electron was the first discovery of a fundamental particle and it is interesting to realize that more than a hundred years later the electron is still to the best measurements we can do today a fundamental letter of nature's alphabet. We can use electrons as ways to probe materials and look at the structure in electron microscopes or in big machines like this accelerator behind me. Pretty much all of, of everything we do in the, in the 21st century depends on understanding the properties of electrons.
Thomson had discovered that the atom is not the fundamental building block of matter. There are smaller objects inside. So atoms could no longer be thought of as hard, indivisible spheres. But how did the electrons fit inside the atom? Thomson suggested that the atom was something like this muffin, with the negatively charged electrons embedded in a positive body. It would be a student of Thomson's that proved him wrong. And you can watch that. All right, next we have Rutherford. He went even further and discovered that the positives and negatives could actually, the positives are actually inside a small nucleus here and the electrons are the space in most of the outside stuff. And I'll stop again here for a video about Rutherford. The mystery of how the electrons fitted inside the atom was eventually solved here in Manchester, in this building in 1911, by Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford was, in my opinion, one of the first proper particle physicists because he used beams of particles as projectiles to explore the structure of matter. Now, of course, in Rutherford's day, there was no such thing as a particle accelerator. So he used the decay of radioactive elements to produce his beams of particles. This is Rutherford's original desk. And in fact, if you hunt around a little bit, you can detect traces of radioactivity a hundred years later. Rutherford asked two of his students, Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden, to fire some alpha particles at a piece of thin gold foil and see what happened. So imagine these tennis balls are the alpha particles. Now if the atom were as Thomson had suggested, a kind of amorphous blob, then you'd expect the alpha particles to pass right through. And that's indeed what happened to most of them. But to their surprise, they found that around one in 8,000 bounced right back. After two years of puzzling over the meaning of these results, Rutherford realised that in order for the alpha particles to bounce back, they must hit something small and dense. So his new model of the atom was a bit like the solar system, with all the mass concentrated at the centre and the electrons orbiting like planets around the sun. Today, we know that this picture isn't quite correct. Quantum mechanics tells us that we can't know precisely where the electrons are but we can predict that they reside in distinct shells around the nucleus. Rutherford's alpha particle scattering experiment was remarkably direct and simple and it showed the nature of what the atomic structure is. By the way the alpha particles bounce off the atom, he worked out where the positive charge of the atom lives. Rutherford had come to the astonishing conclusion that most of the atom, and therefore most of what we think of as ordinary matter, is in fact empty space. So if this apple were the atomic nucleus, the electrons would be a kilometre away. After discovering the nucleus, Rutherford continued doing experiments, firing particles at different targets to delve into the structure of the nucleus itself. By 1932, Rutherford and his colleague James Chadwick had found that the nucleus is made of two kinds of particles, positively charged protons and electrically neutral neutrons. The discovery in these experiments of neutrons, uncharged atoms of mass one, has proved of great significance and importance, and has given us a much clearer understanding of the actual structure of nuclei. Uh, finally, Bohr came up with the idea uh, based on the discovery of the planets and orbits, so forth, uh, that they were spinning around. All right. Now, he was using a lot of good previous evidence, such as spectra, to, to demonstrate this is to be true. Now, this one's the colours given off from copper. The ones given off from hydrogen are given here, which ends up giving a nice red colour. 
what happens is you you burn the flame, you split it up into a prism here, it'll break it up into what you can see, and for hydrogen, you'll get these specific lines. Now, he explained that as electrons are moving up a shell because you're exciting them, maybe burning them. As they move back down, they release a specific wavelength. Now, if the electron jumped to the third or fourth or fifth level and then went back down, they would release these higher energy levels and every element had specific uh, fingerprints which gave a lot of evidence to this shell theory. The other thing that was quite significant is by using the density of pure crystals they were able to determine quite crudely what the general size of atoms were and they'd worked out that, that Mendeleev was kind of uh, on track here with these periodic changes of slowly decreasing jumping up a shell slowly decreasing, jumping up a shell, which agreed with what Bohr was saying, that things are in shells. And this is first, second, third, fourth shell. They get bigger because there's a bigger shell. They sh the shells get smaller, so the atom size gets smaller because the shell's the same. The only thing is there's more electrons in each shell. But the number of protons in the nucleus is getting larger as you go across. Therefore, the pull on this shell is larger, and so the electrons on the outside are getting more and more attractive to the inner positive nucleus, so that's why they're slightly getting smaller as you go across. Jump up, gets big again to the next level, the next shell, and nothing changes. It's the same shell, but the protons are increasing. Therefore, the electrons are more closely attracted to that positive nucleus, so they get smaller. Those two things were fairly solid proof that electrons are in shells of some sort. Now, we won't go on to SPD orbitals and further developments. I will leave that for chemistry, higher level, standard level chemistry. And we'll just touch on Mosley because now we're starting to talk more about subatomic particles and mathematics and more abstract uh, determination of what the atoms are made of. Mosley determined that they the positive particles are protons, and the interestingly enough, the atomic t atomic uh, periodic table was actually increasing in proton number, which is quite a long time after the periodic table was was accepted. Uh, he died in the war, which is a huge tragedy. Uh, I think Britain at that time banned scientists from becoming soldiers after that. Uh, so that's also another interesting aspect. Now, there are further aspects. It's getting very mathematical after that, but that should give you a general understanding of the way that we use evidence and experiments to work out uh, and discover more about science and atomic theory. Okay.